I love the classic monsters. We all grew up on them, whether it was the Universal monsters or Hammer's take on them, or heck, even the Monster Squad's take or Drac Pack, if you know what that was. But yeah, I love them. And I, I did a video a while back on unusual takes on Dracula. And I figured let's do that again, but this time with Frankenstein. So we're gonna check out 10 oddball takes on the Frankenstein legend. And you know, sometimes they're gonna call Frankenstein the guy and other times they're gonna call him the monster. Um, and I, I'm fine with either one because let's face it, Doc, Dr. Frankenstein, his last name is Frankenstein. And if he's making the monster, he's creating him, and the the the, con the, the monster kind of calls him father or thinks of him as like a father figure. So technically, the monster's last name would be Frankenstein. So Frankenstein's monster is also Frankenstein. I, there. Number ten. Our first stop is back in 1998 with Full Moon's take on it with Frankenstein Reborn, part of their film Monsters line, which gave their versions of the classic Universal Monsters. It was directed by Julian Breen, no relation to Neil, a pseudonym for David Decatu, so there's a chance that we'll see Frank in some tidy whities Young Anna here goes to live with her uncle Victor Frankenstein, who's a Baywatch guy, and of course he's doing the experiments that you'd expect. Anna seems to be from the modern times, but oddly, everyone else acts like it's the 1800s. And Vic eventually has a human subject, revealing a pretty lanky monster, complete with usual stitched up face. It escapes, of course, losing some of its bandage to show off a, a back tattoo and causing issues with the villagers. But he's definitely the misunderstood monster variety, and Anna tries to help out. She gets him clothes and food, and yeah, it's pretty much just a simple reinterpretation of the source material, just really rushed and confusing, what with the addition of Anna, literally the only character that seems like she's from our times, except the boom mic. This movie was shot in only six days and was filmed back to back with Talisman on the same sets and was one of only the two movies from the whole film Monsters line, even though that they had planned several more. Anna is actually played by Haven Pascal, and this was her debut film. But she would then go on to become a major voice actress. It's pretty simplistic and doesn't really offer anything new to the classic, but it does feature one of the funniest fire effects that you're gonna see in any movie. Number nine. Well, we're bound to find something different with 2018's Baby Frankenstein, right? This is from indie director John Yon Condi and has a family moving into a new town. And when Lance discovers a secret room in the house, he finds Baby Frankenstein there. BF is soon discovered and has the classic look, but is of course smaller and has a Silent Night, Deadly Night 3 style brain dome. They take him in, but he's also being hunted down by his creator, who just so happens to be Sean from Monster Squad, who I guess never got over losing that Frank monster, huh? They take him bowling while he's being hunted, and this is definitely a very low budget affair, and contrary to this box art, isn't really horror oriented. It's more of an old school little monster adjusts to the world with the help of the neighborhood kids movie, and it's pretty damn charming. The acting is good all around and it's shot really well, and the baby Frankenstein design looks great. The story's paper thin, it's basically kids hide BF while other guys hunt BF. And I guess if you're in the mood for monster Frankenstein, you're gonna be disappointed. Like if, if you chose this movie based on that poster, you'll be taken aback by the almost family friendly fair that's contained within. Like it's very clearly doing the ET thing to the point that they take him trick or treating with a ghost costume over his head. Although this might be the only sorta of kid-friendly film that features a blue velvet reference. And yeah, I enjoyed this quite a bit. It's oddly sweet and although lightweight, uh, a good time. Number eight. 
We go now on a journey through the ages with the curiously titled Frankenstein 80, which was actually from 1972, and from Italy. It kicks off right away with a woman being killed, and there's a doctor named Schwartz who's doing these experiments with transplants, coincidentally with a heart, right after that woman in the intro had her heart ripped off. So, hmm. He's got this serum, and they go out of their way to say that it's the only bottle in existence, so of course it's stolen by Fritz here. And I mean, with, with that name, uh, you should know that, that he's not on the level, right? I don't know if it's the transfer that I'm watching, but everyone seems to have weird makeup on or something. The, the skin tones seem all messed up. It's weird. And meanwhile, the killer continues his work, targeting only women, and it's the work of Otto Frankenstein, who has created a monster. I begin the testicle transplant. You know, uh, most Frankenstein movies skip over the part where they attach the balls. I think this is the first of its kind, the first Frankenstein movie to make sure that we, the audience, are fully aware that this particular monster has a penis. He's referred to as Mosaic, and the creature design and effects are actually by Carl Rambaldi, who would go on to work on lots of huge projects, including winning a couple of Oscars for doing Alien and E.T. And to be honest, that's the main reason to check this one out. It, it doesn't hold much in common with the original tale except to take the good doctor's name and M.O. But it's got a solid helping of grindhouse sleaze to it. The whole film just feels like pretty grimy, like dirty enough that anytime you see a doctor, you're really questioning the sanitary methods of that entire hospital. Like, Look at Otto. He's about 70 years old with this hair, this stash, mutton chops, and just overall oily appearance. Overall, this one's a little on the dull side. It doesn't even really feel like Frankenstein and doesn't even take place in 1980, nor was it released in 1980. Uh, yeah, this is just weird. Number seven. Our next step on the journey is 2011's Frankenstein. Day of the Beast, which claims to give us a new take on the story. So, we'll see. It begins mid-story with the monster on the loose in the countryside, preying on a family, and this is not our gentle, misunderstood creature of the classic film, nor is it the intelligent beast of the novel. This one is a cruel, sadistic killer, and Victor is marrying Elizabeth in secret, and it's of course interrupted by the monster seeking his revenge. It's essentially the end of the novel, but with lots more walking in the woods, of course, and watching low-budget movies, you're always going to see lots and lots of walking in the woods. They tell of the experiments in flashbacks, and we see the creature being reanimated in a more low-key, lightning-less fashion, so more like the novel. Turns out that he likes to eat people, but it very quickly gets us back to hiding from the monster in the countryside, and it, it's not terrible, but in the long run, it takes a short portion of the book and expands it to feature length without really adding any new insight. So I guess it just kind of feels uh, un unnecessary. The monster here is pretty dopey, sticking to a fairly classic representation of the character, very film inspired, but a, a lot cheaper looking. And according to IMDb, this movie had a budget of $1.2 million, which is either wildly inaccurate or else someone managed to launder a million dollars. And it's fine at all, I, I don't hate it, but eventually you realize that you're just watching one long chase scene with no character development or story arc. Honestly, the only thing that's unexpected is the ending, but it's not really worth the, the time spent. Number six. Next up is Frankenstein Reborn, but hey, hey, did, didn't we, didn't we already do that? Well, yeah, but this is 2005's Frankenstein Reborn from The Asylum, so, uh, oh boy, I, I think we know what to expect. It starts with a woman's legs being pulled off uh, in, a, in a guy named Victor's lab, so three, three guesses what his last name is, and Victor's institutionalized by Matt Damon smushed in a juice presser. 
We flash back to Victor's story in which he's working on some sort of nano treatment to help restore motor functions to the handicapped Bryce. And it works, but their subject suffers from bad dreams and the weird compulsion to hold a gun up to his head while talking. Of course, then Victor decides to use his uh, nano stuff to revive a full dead body. And like most asylum entries, the quality is top of the line with some great sound work. The place I found, replacement lab. Very good. And the body's still fresh, not yet decomposed. And the brain's still working on. This is one of those high-end hospital laboratories in which all the employees are attractive white people, which definitely exist outside of movies. It, it's kind of weird and slightly confusing what's taking place when, and there's drug use and assistant threesomes, just, just like Mary Shelley would have wanted. And it turns out that the corpse they revived was their original test subject. And, and, and like 50 minutes in, we're finally getting Frank and Bryce. And he's a pretty cool looking makeup. And at times, the storyline seems to follow the original story, like vaguely. And there's a series of pretty gruesome murders and this one takes such a long time to get going, but once the monster gets involved, it's mildly enjoyable. It even dips slightly into Bride of Frankenstein territory and pays a little tribute to Tales from the Crypt. It's not great, but it has a couple of fun moments, and I'll be honest, I, 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 just, I just couldn't stop laughing at Matt Damon in a funhouse mirror. Number five. Now let's go way back to 1965 and head to Japan for Frankenstein Conquers the World, otherwise known as Frankenstein vs. Baragon, and, and yes, it's a kaiju Frank. We have a doctor during World War II who the Nazis steal a mysterious box from and give it to the Japanese Navy, who say that it's Frankenstein's heart and that it's still alive, but then Hiroshima is bombed. 15 years go by and we meet Dr. Bowen here and they find a feral boy running around and he starts to grow, looking more and more familiar. And it's revealed that Frankenstein can never die and will always regrow. And he gets pretty massive and escapes. Oddly, his clothing grows in size with him and he's soon huge but doesn't really seem interested in attacking people. And it, Pretty funny watching what amounts to a fairly typical kaiju film with a skinny dude in Frankenstein makeup. But then Baragon shows up and here, here's the kicker. This is his first appearance, but Baragon went on to appear in quite a few additional Godzilla films and they seemed to know who he was already, which means that this film is most likely in continuity with the G films. And sadly, the two giants don't face off until there's only about 10 minutes left of the movie. There was a sequel to this one called Frankenstein's Monsters Sanda vs. Gaida, but it's sort of hidden in the US where it was released as War of the Gargantuas. There's two Frankenstein creatures in that one. One is green and the other is brown. In the American version, the word Frankenstein is changed. And it's actually uh, a lot more enjoyable than this one. But then their version of the monster would practically vanish only appearing in a couple of TV shows. Number four. Let's switch it up and go with something more modern with 2014's I, Frankenstein by Stuart Beatty, who had written a series of high profile movies like the original Pirates of the Caribbean and was still pretty new to the directing scene. It starts off in 1795 and actually picks up right after the ending of the book with the creature and the dock in the Arctic. The monster is a little two-faced, but then suddenly there's demon-faced guys and flying people, just like Mary Shelley would have wanted. Eowyn and Captain Boomerang are here and they're gargoyles fighting against 666 legions of demons from hell. And really, what, what the hell is this? It's like somebody forgot to read the source material that they were working from because this is less gothic and more Riddick. Frank goes by the name Adam and it jumps to modern times where he gets a haircut and then Chuck's girl is here as is Sean's stepdad as if you need any more evidence that this was just an exercise in 
oh hey remember underworld let's just do that with frankenstein they even brought in the deep voiced kevin grievous who was also in underworld because why not and in fact grievous wrote the comic book and story that the film was based upon and, and he also wrote underworld and this was intended to tie into that universe and and in an early form of the script Celine was supposed to make an appearance. It cost about $65 million to make and yet only made around $75 million worldwide, which was considered a pretty big disappointment, and was torn apart by critics as it currently sits at a mere 5% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It's not hard to see why, considering it's stitched together from the parts of other films, but without a soul of its own, kind of like their lead character and it's kind of weird that they that they treat this as sort of a superhero origin story and that frankenstein is now humanity's protector when the film and character starts with him murdering an innocent woman just to get back at his dad number three 1990 gave us a pretty epic take on the material with Roger Corman's Frankenstein Unbound, which would be the notorious low-budget king's return to the director's chair after a 20-year absence. It actually starts in the year 2031 with the Elephant Man as a scientist who has developed a new weapon that has some unusual side effects, and including rifts in space and time that, that pulled Doc Buchanan in his Auto Man car back to 1817 where he meets Victor Frankenstein played by freaking Raul Julia, Mr. Gomez Adams, M. Bison himself. And this guy has a Golden Globe and was nominated for a bunch more for great dramatic roles like Kiss of the Spider Woman and The Burning Season. But I guarantee the 98% of, of everyone that just saw his face back there said, oh hey, it, it's Gomez. I should point out that this movie was actually based on a novel from 1974 and instead of a scientist, he's an American man who traveled back from the future year of 2020 where there's a huge political snarl that threatens the future of all of America. I, I'm not going to say anything at all. The third Linda is here as well as Mary Shelley herself who's writing all this down. The monster's already loose and killing in the countryside, and he's played by Nick Brimble, and oddly the opening credits say introducing Nick Brimble, although he has over a dozen credits before this movie, going all the way back to 1970, and is still quite active today. The creature wants a mate, and Buchanan meets Lord Byron, played by Michael, or the guy that's not Keanu Reeves, and then Percy Shelley, played by Michael Hutchins from NXS, and Oddly, there's a love scene and subplot between 50-year-old Hurt and 26-year-old Fonda, which, yeah, it's just weird. But it's just weird in general to see John Hurt in the romantic leading role anyway. But this is a pretty good time. It's a bit slow in the center, and I wish that there was more character stuff going on there, since the idea of a guy out of time isn't really explored as, as much as it can be. But the performances are pretty great, all around and it, it's a bit more of an upscale affair for a, for a Corman movie even if it never really lives up to his reputation to be the movie that brought him out of a 20-year retirement and remains his last directorial work and oddly it tries to shoehorn in uh, an environmental message at the very ending um the very laser beam heavy ending number two Let's head all the way back to 1973 now with Blackenstein, also known as Black Frankenstein. Put out in the aftermath of the success of Blackula, although it was not nearly as successful. Dr. Walker meets with the curiously named Dr. Stein to discuss her fiance who was wounded in Vietnam. And the doc has several patients, including a woman who needs an injection every 12 hours or she'll rapidly age. And Bruno, who has, well, we don't, we don't talk about him. And Eddie agrees to try the doc's limb replacement surgery. But unfortunately, a jealous assistant sabotages the experiment, which creates some side effects. And pretty soon he's out and about pulling limbs off of racist hospital workers. There's a cameo from Desperate Living's Liz Renee, and you know, I don't know much about chemistry and mad scientist stuff, but 
I have a feeling that just leaving big vats of bubbling formula isn't really the safest thing to do anyway. Eddie roams around now sporting an ill-fitting suit and turtleneck, and I guess the formula made his forehead grow and his afro expand for some reason, and he's actually played by Joe DeSue, who was not an actor, and it kind of shows, but according to the director, he was a client of Frank Seletri. Seletri was the writer and producer, but was also a lawyer, and apparently either just really liked or owed a favor to DeSue, so he put him in the movie. The same was also true about Liz Renee. When Malcolm finally crosses the line, Eddie goes on a rampage, and this one doesn't quite have the fun and charm of Blackula, and the black part of Blackenstein isn't really a thing, with the exception of the racist orderly. There's no actual mention of the race aspect of the character to, to, to differentiate it. It's just sort of another version of Frankenstein, modernized a bit. It, it's pretty enjoyable though, and it has an oddly unexpected ending. Like it, it's nothing extremely jarring or anything or so wild that you have to see it to believe it. But I will say that I wouldn't have predicted it in a million years. Number one. We finished this off back in 1985 with The Bride. Probably a more noted, but I, I think still kind of unsung version of the tale, although that might just be nostalgia talking because the film was savaged by critics and was a rather big box office bomb. Sting is our Dr. Frankenstein and he's already made a monster and it's the Kurgan. They're repeating the experiment to create the Bride of Frankenstein, and it works with way less extreme of a hairstyle as the original, but she rejects him, causing the monster to destroy the castle. He flees and meets a time bandit while the doc tells everyone that the Bride is a woman they found with amnesia. Renato teaches the creature to drink and names him Victor because, oh yeah, in this movie, Dr. Frankenstein's name is Charles for some reason, so the monster gets to have the name Victor. They end up finding a traveling circus run by Alexi Sale. Dr. Martins, Dr. Martins, Dr. Martins, and they both end up working there while Eva starts to unlock the secrets of her past, which eventually lead her to the Dread Pirate Roberts and Andre Toulon. And yeah, I kind of love this. I know that it's not great, and it has its detractors, and the criticisms are valid. It's a pretty stale film when it focuses on Eva and um, Charles, but I love every moment with Victor and Ronaldo, with a dazzling performance from David Rappaport, a truly underappreciated actor, just a few years before he sadly committed suicide after a long battle with depression. It definitely gets a bit long-winded, but it's nice to see one of these with the monster as the clear hero of the film, and the doctor played as the villain, even if Sting's portrayal lacks the punch that you would hope comes from that role. You may watch this one and just dismiss it as underbaked crap, and, and you're probably right, but I guess I like my crap like I like my pizza. Uh, slightly underbaked. So there you have it, 10 movies about Frankenstein or Frankenstein's monster if you are going to continue to be pedantic, but I think that we've covered that. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed most of these. I'd say uh, about 80% of these I thought were a blast. A couple of them were eh, blah, but uh, for the most part, they're, they're pretty entertaining. I, I, I got a kick out of them. Uh, there's tons, tons more Frankenstein movies to cover, uh, so you will be seeing a sequel to this in the future. So if you have a favorite, let me know down below. Uh, which one you want to see. I, I think I've written down about 30 or 40 other movies with Frankenstein in it. The, the list was pretty long. Um, so uh, if you didn't see one that you really like, just know that I, I've got it earmarked for a future edition of this list. Um, but yeah, you're going to see some other monster lists. I want to see some weird mummy takes. I want to see some weird wolfman takes. I want to see all that stuff, some oddball Phantom of the Operas. Uh, yeah, so well, I'll, I'll do some other lists with that stuff in the future. But let me know what you thought of this one down below. Give me some comments. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you like what you see on the channel, hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the bell if you want notifications for more episodes. These guys are my patrons because they're awesome and I appreciate them and I appreciate you guys 
for watching this video. Um, just keep on watching. I, I, you know, there's a lot more to come. I've got some pretty wild stuff uh, in plan for you guys in the near future. So buckle up and enjoy. I'll see you very shortly for another great video. Thanks a lot, guys, and bye-bye.